Let's bring up the co-creator and showrunner of Snowfall, Dave Andron. Come on up. California, no now listen to that. Good to have you. Oh my gosh. I just want to ask everyone I see, like, where's my money? That's how I feel after watching this. I, uh, so I'm, I'm so excited to be with you. I, I've seen, I love the show. I've, I've seen it, big fan. Uh, I want to start talking about you first. A lot of writers that, that I've spoken to, that I've seen, start as a writer's assistant for too many years and then end up becoming a writer. Uh, for lack of a better term, you kind of skipped a little bit, skipped some steps and went directly into being a writer. Yeah, I mean, by the grace of kind of one person, I really got to skip those steps. I, I will say that one of the nice things about being a writer is you have the ability to kind of produce your own material and you don't have to rely on anybody else, right? As an actor, you need a script. As a director, you need a ton of things, including money. But as a writer, if you have a computer and some time, you can bang out 50 pages that can change your life in a hurry. Uh, and so I, I did that. I moved down here. I studied fiction in college, thought I might go that route, um, decided that wasn't for me, and moved out here and, and wrote, spent the better part of two years really writing one script initially. Um, and it took a while to figure out how to do it and whatever, because I hadn't taken classes. I hadn't kind of done any of that. Um, and had worked odd jobs but ended up getting it into the hands of a guy named Graham Yost through like a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy um, who had created a show that was on NBC and he gave me a job as a staff writer on that show, uh, which is bananas and it, I think it rarely happens that way, but it was kind of having a piece of material that people were willing to keep handing on to somebody else to be like, here, you should read this, you should read this. Was it intimidating coming in not having been a writer's assistant, just jumping in the deep end? I guess it should have been. I think in all things, probably it helps to have some confidence that's probably unwarranted. <laughs> um, I that's don't know. My life. So yeah. I just kind of felt like he came in and just pretended like I knew what time it was and uh, it worked out okay. Well, that's good. Yeah. Uh, and I know that the, the show, the first show that you got on was Reigns, I think. Yep. Uh, for those that don't know, this was a show about a detective partnering with ghosts to solve crimes. It wasn't technically ghosts. I'm sorry. I'm I sorry. will clarify, which is maybe part of why that show didn't work. Yeah. I, I will say, in the defense of Graham, uh, the idea being when somebody's murdered, it's very rarely random. Usually they know the person who's responsible. And so the idea was a detective who was losing his mind, who was essentially hallucinating his victims, such that if he could get to know them better throughout the course of the episode, he would find out why somebody would have wanted them dead. Right, so in the first episode, he initially shows up, and there's a girl who's been murdered, and she's this very sweet, kind of innocent girl, and then he finds out at a certain point she's a prostitute, and all of a sudden she's like made up and smoking, and she's like, great, now I'm a hooker. But it was all about a guy who was kind of losing losing his shit a little bit. Makes sense that they yeah, cast so Jeff Goldblum. Yeah, so sorry. You're right. Yeah. Cast Jeff Goldblum. I, I, he's, he's amazing. He's the perfect guy to play it, because he, you always watch that guy, and you feel like something else is going on in his brain. <laughs> Sure. Um, so he was a great guy to look like he was losing it. So I imagine, I mean, I don't necessarily see connections with that topic in Snowfall, but were there any lessons that you learned in that writer's room or from anyone in that room that you kind of carried through your career? Man, so many. I mean, as you point out, kind of coming in and not knowing just everything from like how a writer's room works to the mechanics of a script. I was able to write an episode that got produced. Um, so being on set and the experience of learning kind of, you know, it's one way in your head on the page and then you get out onto set and all of a sudden it's like all the things you kind of thought were maybe going to happen aren't quite happening and you've got to figure that out. So I, yeah. everything from storytelling to production stuff, there was kind of unlimited lessons learned. Wow. I, and I, I would imagine it's not, it doesn't always happen that in your first, in your first show as a new writer that you would get your own episode. Yeah, I think that was just continual to kind of push and be in there and throwing ideas out. And yeah. um, again, yeah, I can't really speak to how that exactly happened, but I was lucky. Sure. Uh, and I think that luck continued because I know your next project was uh, the Knight Rider remake. Wh <laughs> you could say it continued or you could hey, say I it detoured. I like Knight Rider. <laughs> I, I like Kit. I'm a big fan of William Daniels. Uh, I'm, I'm into it. Thanks. Uh, so I know you you developed that. Uh, even though you developed, I, I believe they, they brought in Gary Scott Thompson to show run. 
Yeah, there was a strange process where I had gone in with a, a set of producers to pitch another idea that NBC was kind of like, we're not going to do that, um, and then called us back and said, we run a reboot Night Rider. Do you guys want to take a swing at it? And at the time, this was kind of right after Reigns, and yeah. I felt kind of, it was amazing they were even asking us to do that, and I felt like this is something they were going to make and put on the air. Um, so we we dove into it, and, and I thought we kind of cracked it, and we did a two-hour pilot. The writer strike happened kind of right as we uh, were locking that script, um, which meant no rewrites. So the process of production was kind of crazy and difficult. Um, but we came through it, and they picked it up to series. And then because I had only worked on one show for one year as a staff writer, they um, they were like, we're going to bring in a guy who we've got to deal with to, to help you run what's going to be a pretty big show for you to take on. And at the time, I was like, well, that's great. I mean, they believe in this guy. Um, it's must be the right thing. I clearly, there's a lot that I don't know. Um, and then looking back, I, sh <laughs> I should have at that point either kind of said, look, I'll run it. I'm going to run it and do a thing I want to do. Or I should have walked away. Did you, do you feel like, yeah, and, I, and I hear what you're saying that maybe it wasn't the best situation. Did you still learn, I guess, watching that, how you might show run in the future. Yeah, I mean, I think you probably learn as much from the experiences where you watch somebody do something really well as mm. you do when you watch somebody do something really poorly. Sure. And so even if the lessons there learned or like, oh, this is how not to, to do things, um, those are important things to learn too. I try and serve that role for a lot of people um, <laughs> in my day to day. Yeah, uh, I've probably served that lesson for people now. I hope <laughs> not. But. Um, and then, uh, you know, jumping a couple shows later, you jump to this really tiny show, I'm sure no one's uh, heard of it, called Justified, which just so happened to be nominated for eight Emmys and won multiple, such a tiny show. Um, what was the journey like getting from Knight Rider to what is, I think it's safe to say, maybe I'm editorializing, what is considered probably one of the best television shows of the past 20 years? Um, man, I hope so, that's a really nice thing to think. Um, yeah, I mean, look, that goes back to Graham Yost. It was the guy who gave me my first job and then I did Knight Rider and wrote a bunch of other pilots and was actually working on another show um, when he called and was like, hey, I've got another thing that's going to go. What are you doing? And unfortunately, when it first started out, I was on this other show. Um, but then thankfully, I guess within a few months, that show was canceled. Um, and that was just a show I was working on the staff of. And so I jumped over onto Justified about halfway through the first season and just ended up writing a couple of episodes for that. But, you know, again, it goes back to Graham, the guy who gave me my first job and then who had created Justified. And it's just lucky that that guy came into my life, really. Yeah, I don't usually love this phrase, but it seems like he's your spirit animal. That's... If, I, if I have a spirit animal, he's my Canadian spirit animal. <laughs> sure. Which is fair. Uh, it seems like also Justified was the first show that you spent multiple seasons on. Yeah. You stayed for a while. Yeah, I mean, I felt like over the course of those th the three shows I'd kind of worked on before that and writing pilots, I thought I had kind of figured some things out. And then spending six years on a really good show, I think kind of rewrote a lot of what I thought I already knew. Um, but that was the experience where I felt like, okay, I really cut my teeth. Like I really yeah. understand what this is and working with really, really high class actors across the board. Um, and producing something that really, you know, look, it was about something. It was about Harlan and about this part of our country that is forgotten. It had this kind of great spine and scope, um, but it also had a kind of a really high entertainment value, um, which is kind of something Elmore Leonard does in all of his, his books, really. Um, but that was, that was by far the best experience uh, I had had up until that point. And that also kind of continued your run of, of, I guess, what one might call like traditional leading men, where you had Timothy Oliphant right after Jeff. Well, I don't know if you'd call Jeff Goldblum traditional, but. You know, really uh, yeah. booming leading men. Yeah, I mean, and that show ended up really becoming a two-hander. You know, there was Tim and then there was Walton Goggins who sure. played Boyd. Um, and they, I don't know if this is this thing that's now out there, I guess. Um, but the, the original pilot had Raylan killing Boyd. Um, and that was supposed to be kind of a one-off and it was supposed to be done. And then they shot the pilot and tested it. And everybody who kind of watched it was like, yeah, like we love the guy with the hat, but like you're going to kill that dude? <laughs> Like, what are you, crazy? Yeah. Um, and FX and Graham kind of quickly agreed, and so they reshot the ending and kept Boyd alive, and then that became the backbone of the show. Like, I don't know what Justified would have been, really, without Boyd, but... Um, and you could see how that show changed over the course of the first season, where it had a very kind of procedural... You know, they pitched it to FX initially as, like, there was a showdown of the week. 
Um, and then I think over the course of that first season, if you watch that show, you watch it become go from kind of a showdown of the week to uh, something that ends up being much more serialized. And then the second season, really you embrace that with the creation of the Bennett family and Mags and the kids. Um, and that was when the show, I feel like, really kind of found its footing. Yeah. And became what it wanted to become. And did you take, were there any kind of bigger lessons that, that you took from Justified moving forward? Anything like come to mind as, as a big lesson that you learned on that show? And there were so many, you know, it's hard to kind of single out one thing. I, I think a certain kind of economy of storytelling. Um, Interesting. I think even getting out of, you know, like in your first job you take, or I was willing to take, you know, whatever I could. And, and I liked Reigns. I think Reigns is a show that in another, kind of done in, in another way with some tweaks could have found an audience and lived a little longer. But it was also very procedural and it was very networky, mm. as was Knight Rider, as was the thing I worked on after that. And I had written pilots for networks over those three or four years. And this was the first time it was like, I was on a cable drama that was serialized where we could get away from a little more of the formulaic kind of network way of doing things and embrace a different style of storytelling where you know the guy in the white hat didn't always have to win um it didn't have sure. to be wrapped up in that episode i think just doing six seasons of a big serialized show was probably the biggest takeaway yeah and that's awesome yeah. and it seems like you chase that down a little bit going in that similar path with snowfall yeah you know i mean i think that while the worlds are so different there are if you kind of look at the tone of Justified and the tone of Snowfall, there are similarities. I mean, it's obviously about um, a very specific time and place, a very kind of difficult moment in our history. Um, but it's still, we still had to lean into the idea that it has to be entertaining. We can't glamorize the drug use, but like people still have to be able to watch it and be uh, on the ride. Uh, and then, of course, there will be moments of horrible violence or addiction and those things. But there's got to be the sugar that makes the medicine go down. Sure. And so talk to us a little bit, I mean, moving into Snowfall, the, the premiere show we're talking about. Um, so I believe it was being, it was created by, by Eric Amadio, John Singleton. It was being developed for Showtime. Talk me through kind of where you came into the picture and how that all came to be. Yeah, they had set it up initially at Showtime. I think the initial, initial idea was Eric's, and then he got paired up with John. Um, for obvious reasons, took it to Showtime, set it up, and they kind of couldn't figure out what the show should be, or at least in Showtime's eyes. Um, and there are a lot of reasons shows don't move forward. So Showtime uh, jettisoned it. At that point, FX picked it up, and they started to kind of redevelop it with FX. Um, and I think they had worked on it for six months a year with FX before I had come on, which was when Justified ended. Um, and FX kind of called to say they had a few projects at that point they were excited about and sent me a couple things. Um, to look at, which I was, I thought that was wonderful. FX is by far the best place I've worked, uh, and I'm hoping I can just work there the rest of my, <laughs> uh, the rest of my career. But read that script, um, and while it kind of wasn't there yet, could see that this was a world that it felt like a story that was important to tell. I was excited about the prospect of working with John, um, and in the you know the prospect of staying with FX. So I kind of jumped in, threw my hat in the ring, and met with those guys, and we all kind of got along and. So got in the process of trying to figure it out with them. Okay, so once you you worked with them, you cracked it, you shot the pilot. From what I understand, that did not go as well as hoped. Yeah, I mean, you know, we put together a small a mini writer's room before so we could kind of start looking ahead um, into the series and then kind of working backwards to set things up in the pilot. So we did some work on the pilot script and looked ahead a little bit. Um, and then put all that on hold to go cast and shoot the pilot. Um, and it just didn't work. I, you know, there were a lot of reasons why things kind of don't work. Mm. Um, I mean, there have been pilots that have been reshot over the years, the Game of Thrones being the kind of most uh, sure. uh, obvious example I can think of. But for any number of reasons, it didn't quite work. Um, within, I think there were script problems still. Some of it was the, the way it was shot. Um, but when we tested it after all was said and done, um, the concept still tested kind of through the roof. Like FX knew that if we could figure out the best way to do it, people would probably want to watch it. And then we had already by that time found uh, Damson Idris, who plays Franklin. Um, and Damson also tested completely off the charts. Um, so we knew we had this incredible kind of star in the making at the center of it and a concept that would work. And so FX then said, all right, now you have to go figure this out. 
like let take John and Eric's thing, you know, take as much as you want out, but you have to figure it out. And if you can figure it out, we would be willing to reshoot the pilot. So I went off for a few months and rewrote the script, which is why we're all three credited as creating it. Um, yeah. And did a heavy rewrite, and it took a little while, but managed to kind of figure it out, or at least figure it out to the point where FX is willing to spend another X <laughs> amount to make it again, and this time it worked. Yeah, I mean, at least it wasn't spending as much as Game of Thrones probably would have cost. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you brought up Damson. I, I did want to talk about that. For, for me, and I don't want to speak for everybody, he is the most captivating part of the show. Um, I was j joking before we came up here that um, there are three equally great storylines, and all I keep wanting to see is more Franklin all the time. <laughs> yeah, I think you and everybody else. I mean, <laughs> you know, there is the possibility that this show was too ambitious in the start. And if you watch the three seasons, you can see that we've kind of narrowed it down and chosen to focus much more on South Central and then on the CIA, which is really what the show is about. Maybe sure. it never should have tried to kind of be a three-legged stool. Um, and I don't know, even if we had executed each storyline at the kind of utmost, you, <laughs> you still have scenes where you have a legitimate, I think, movie star on the screen, and then you have scenes where you don't. And it's always, those scenes are always going to kind of pale in comparison, no matter how well they're executed, because that kid is so good. Yeah, he's, he's incredible. The interesting thing that took me by surprise in, in watching the show is I'm watching, I'm like, oh, what a authentic guy. They got this great LA kid. And then I start looking up interviews, and I just hear like, oh, you know, I love doing the show. And I'm like, oh, is he British? What's happening I here? Know. You found a British guy who perfectly encapsulated LA in the 80s. I know. Um, and look, it was, a, it was a big discussion point, and it was not an easy decision to mm. make, really. I mean, we saw the tape, and I strangely, through like friends of friends, knew his manager, um, and she had reached out and said, you're gonna get a tape by this client of mine. He's British, he's amazing. So I, I knew that he was British going in, but um, I would not have been able to tell from the tape if I hadn't been told. His accent was already that good. Um, he was classically trained, and part of their training going through those the schools in the UK is they have to have like not only an English accent, uh, American accent, but multiple dialects. Like they literally will make them do a Southern accent and like a normal West Coast and like a Boston or New York. I mean, they really put them through the ringer. Um, the, the other thing is they grow up watching our movies, so they all have a good accent. Where like we don't really <laughs> grow up watching British film, so we don't. Sure. Um, so, so his tape from the beginning was really good, but then it just became about, um, I think we were right about the same time that Samuel Jackson had come out very publicly and been like, what is it with people casting African, British African actors to play African American actors um, or characters in shows? Um, and John Singleton, I think rightly, was very opposed to it um, and was like, look, I'm not casting a fucking British kid to play this guy from South Central that is my world where I have people I'm excited about. And the process went on for months and months, um, even after seeing Damson. We like flew him out here to have him audition in person, and John was still kind of like, nah. Um, and ultimately, it just came down to, you know, the two or three people we had found, and Damson being so much better. And <laughs> it basically came down to, look, do you want to make this thing with this kid, or do you want to not make the thing? Oh wow! And it was like, well, you, you probably have to go with the person who gets your television show made. Um, sure. And and look, you know, we put him through the paces, and he spent a lot of time in South Central, and we brought in Dub C, a West Side Connection, to like work with him to make it as authentic as possible. Um, but look, it was, it was never kind of an easy choice. It just seemed like it had to kind of happen that way. Was it hard going to bat for, for him, uh, I guess not against, but in conversation with someone like John Singleton? I mean, this is someone who I, I think a lot of us who love film all know John's work uh, and, and everything that he used to do. And now you're coming in, this is the first show that you're officially running, and you're kind of talking to a legend of sorts saying, you're wrong and here's why. <laughs> is that, was that tough for you? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I hope I didn't ever phrase it quite like that. But, <laughs> I uh, hope so too. Yeah, um, yeah look, it was, it was very difficult. And, and I certainly in the beginning was willing to kind of be like, look, absolutely, I think we should look at every possible person and really do our diligence and I understand the concerns and like I had to respect very much that it was John's world. I mean I grew up in LA but I didn't grow up in South Central, right? Um, and I I wanted to be as respectful as I could of, of that uh, and of what he wanted to do. 
Um, and I, but I think ultimately, ultimately there was kind of no choice. Yeah, but to grab, but to go with Amazon. Yeah, I, you know, I've I've read articles which essentially say that a lot of the actors that we watch today made the choice undeniable, and it sounds like that's what Damson did for you. Yeah, very much. And look, I'm sorry, but it's also it, it's it's called fucking acting. Like, I don't know the idea that we have to be hiring like that person to play that person. Like, that's part of the great thing. I I personally don't want to be put in a corner where it's like, all right, man. You're like a middle-aged white dude. Like now, you just write middle-aged white dudes for the rest of your career. Sure. Or like you're this person. You have to now play that person for the rest of your career. Like I think part of what's lovely about creating something is like, you know, doing the homework, like trying to get inside people's heads as much as possible. But like, the process of exploring another person's life, an experience that isn't your own, and articulating that is part of what the juice of this whole thing is. Um, and I think it'd be a real shame to kind of tell people they can't. They're not allowed to portray that person or not allowed to try to write that person just because of the color of their skin or where they were born or whatever. No, yeah, I um, and I have some questions about that. The one question I wanted to ask before we get there, because this captivated me so much, is the music in the show, yeah. uh, incredible, uh, invokes a nostalgia from the 80s that, especially for this particular geography, that few shows do. I mean, I'm sure you heard West Coast Pop Block played as you walked up here. I mean, that is, that was, that opens the show. Yeah. Uh, John, John Singleton, obviously has a history in bringing music into a lot of his uh, projects in really interesting ways. Did you both uh, work closely with your music supervisor to kind of evoke a lot of this? Create, create the world? Yeah, very much. I mean, he, you can tell from his movies that um, he not only kind of had a great sense of story, but he really understood pop culture. Like, he really did. He saw what people responded to. He was always thinking about that, like, what's gonna, the audience going to respond to? And it was so personal to him. Um, so not only was he great about kind of the more well-known things, but, like, he would, he would get so excited about a song that um, was so obscure, more so even than the really fame. It would be like, no, nah, man, everyone's heard that you can't use that shit. Like, everyone knows that. Um, but have something else that, that was not as well known, that was so personal to him, that was like on the radio that day when he was like going through it. Um, and those are the things, frankly, you know, there's a lot that I'll miss about working with him going forward. Um, but that specifically, those little things, those little details that he got so excited about, um, that again, just aren't my experience. Hmm. Like they just, I don't have that little thing. I wasn't in the room that day, you know, when that song was on. Um, I think those things, you know, not that you need someone affirming you, but I do think that a lot of those songs, at the very least for me, when I watched it, put me probably where he was. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, that's a big part of doing a show that's a period piece. Like, that, for the moment you hear that, it kind of puts you right back. It's funny that the younger people who watch it don't know. Like, we started, we used Blood on the Leaves um, in the finale this year, and I know on Twitter, there were some younger people who were like, oh, they're using that Kanye sample? Oof. And I was like, oh, boy. oh, man. But that happens like throughout where they just know, because they've all been, all these like classic songs have been sampled. There's all bits and pieces. And they'll be like, oh, that's that. And it's like, no, it's the, uh, it's the original. I should also mention, of course, our music supervisor's name is Maggie Phillips, uh, yeah. who's amazing. And look, we, have a, we had a lot of money. I think we spent close to half a million on the pilot, on the music in the pilot. And then after that, we had like 65,000 an episode, um, which was a very rude, awful awakening. Um, yeah, but like, what let's she's just managed play to... jingles from old commercials. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's funny you say that. My dad actually is a musician who wrote jingles uh, his whole career. That's why I said it. For all commercials. Yeah. You're deep diving, man. I appreciate that kind of, that level of research. We got some gotcha journalism here, you know? Yeah, I mean? that's really good. Um, yeah, they, what they've done to stretch that number is pretty, it's pretty amazing. Uh, one of the things you were talking about earlier is you said, you know, you don't want to be, I'm quoting, by the way, I think you're wonderful, but a middle-aged white guy just writing for middle-aged white guys. Um, and to me, you're just talent. I don't see your age or your color. Um, but it, it takes me to, there's a moment in the, in the pilot of the first season uh, where we're watching this and uh, Franklin's mother's on the phone and uh, he's staring at her and she gets off the phone and she goes, what are you looking at? And he says, I was just admiring how good your white voice got. Your white and, phone voice. Yes, your white phone voice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I cannot take credit for that line. I, I frankly don't even know if that was John or Eric. Yeah. Um, but it was, yeah. I mean, that line, I think that that's definitely, it was the first, but certainly not the last uh, reference to code switching yeah. 
uh, in in the entire series. You know, I guess from your perspective, not just in the series, but as someone who's writing it, your uh, the requirement for you to code switch a little bit yep. uh, as a writer. What were the challenges in that kind of writing dialogue that is authentic to a group of people that you were and are not a part of? Yeah, I mean, look, part of, I think, my job in, in this show more than maybe something else I would create and run is to also know what I don't know, mm. right? Is to really embrace, I mean, our writing staff is as diverse as any writing staff, I would say, out there. Um, same with our crew. I mean, we really tried to bring together a group of people who knew the world, who could speak to the world. Um, and it was always a question a little bit for me of um, once I had to go rewrite the pilot, knowing that like, I always thought I was gonna be shepherding a vision of John's. And when I realized that it was gonna have to be, that I was gonna have to step a little bit more out in front of it, um, that I definitely had to question it where it was like, how much can I be out in front of this? I always knew that I'd have to rely on people heavily whose experience it was. As much as I could parrot the voice or like go back to experiences that I had growing up in that world, um, it really, um, it came down to always knowing that like I had to be willing to listen to other people and make sure that if somebody was calling me out and being like, oh, you can't say that, that's bullshit, um, you know, really listening to that. Uh, and relying on people like Dub C and like John um, to just make sure that everything was exactly what it should be. Yeah, I imagine Dub C would not have been shy about telling you what didn't work. Dub C is the greatest. He's so <laughs> cool about it and respectful, though. He was always like, yo, man, you just, you might want to, and I was like, just tell me, dude. You don't have to wind up. <laughs> um, but it's been, it's been really, it's been the experience so far of my career getting to be a part of this, of the world of South Central and like be trusted by our actors, by you know, other writers to, to write the show and, um, and own it in that way. It's been a very cool thing. Yeah, I think, I think what's really interesting is not only with the dialogue, but you know, we're talking about, there's some pretty heavy topics in this show. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen it, but you know, we're talking about CIA drug trafficking and the Iran-Contra and all those other things. Um, what did you do, I guess, to set yourself up and your writer's room up for uh, being historically accurate and, and things along those lines? Yeah, I mean, you know, we're clearly playing a little fast and loose, um, certainly with the CIA stuff. Sure. You know, like there's a lot of conspiracy stuff. There was obviously Dark Alliance and the Gary Webb about what the CIA's role might have been in what happened in South Central. Um, and I think we did make the decision, you know, look, we did as much research as we could with, with those out there and try to read both sides because they're, again, with the internet now, you can go down whatever rabbit hole you want and you will find things to support whatever crazy theory you want to have going on in your head. Um, so we tried to kind of look at stuff on both sides of the line and formulate something that felt like it might have been close to the truth. And I think, look, as a group, we kind of ultimately felt like trying to sell the idea that the US government was pumping drugs specifically into these communities to destroy them felt like we would lose credibility. It felt like a step too far. What did feel real to us through all the interviews we had done and the stuff we looked at was that they were looking the other way uh, that, to make sure that cocaine was, being, was, was able to be brought in to fund this war in Nicaragua. Um, and I think an understanding consequence of that was all of a sudden the cocaine prices went down, like hugely went down, um, and crack was able to kind of take off. I think that that's something that is probably a truth. Now, nobody in the CIA has ever gone on record saying that that was the case, and probably nobody ever will. Um, and in that regard, you could call us out and be like, well, you're bullshit, and like that's not, there's no evidence really to support that, aside from maybe a disgraced journalist who ended up killing himself. And if you don't know that story, it's worth looking into. It's pretty fucking wild. Um, but the stuff that was happening in South Central and the way that that neighborhood, what the show ultimately is about is how a working class neighborhood went to a war zone in two years. I mean, that's literally the backbone of the whole thing. And those details, the reality of that, um, I don't think we're fudging at all. Is it, I mean, is it hard to balance? Right now you've got, you're balancing the dialogue, you're balancing historical accuracy, and then you're also balancing the show, pretty much every episode, has South Central, East LA, and the CIA. So you're balancing, I, I think the phrase used was three-legged stool. Yeah. That's what you used. Uh, 
you're balancing all three of those. Is it hard to get the exposition necessary and the historical points necessary across three different storylines and still keep them engaging? Yeah, I mean, I think if you, as you watch the show, I mean, what you've seen is that it's kind of, it has again whittled down kind of more into being just about South Central and just mm. about the CIA. I mean, ultimately, I think we were hoping this would also be a love letter to LA uh, and what happened to LA over the course of this, but the reality is crack just did not, it didn't kind of decimate and infest uh, East LA the way it did South Central. Um, and so it just wasn't as integral a part of telling the story. Now, what is becoming an integral part of telling the story is that the cocaine was initially coming up through the Bahamas into Florida and being brought across the country. And then there was a massive crackdown in 83, 84 in Florida. And all of a sudden, those routes got primarily shut down. And what happened was the Mexican border opened up. Um, once they realized there was this huge market for cocaine, certainly in Southern California. Um, so that is a way now that we can kind of tie that initial East LA storyline back into the fabric of the story we're telling. Mm. But yeah, look, it's tough to do, to tell a story that's that ambitious. It's hard to set up one world, I think, and make it really feel fully fleshed out and authentic. And it's really hard to do it with three. It's also hard to do it in 42 minutes. You know, we don't have the 55 minutes and the $12 million you might have on HBO, frankly, to do it. Um, and that's okay. There's liberation and some of the constraints, but um, we have to be aware of what we're trying to do and how much time we have to do it. Sure. Uh, a big theme of the show seems to be that a lot of us pretend to be someone we're not, but in doing so, we may be fine that we're closer to that person than we thought, <laughs> right? You look at someone like Franklin in the first episode, he's hiding the fact that he smokes weed from his mother, and by the end of season three, he's the person behind the gun, right? You see someone like uh, his mother pretending to be someone she's not on the phone and she wears fake teeth and all those other things. You see Teddy, a CIA agent, who seems to be the nicest, friendliest guy in the world, but now we see he's behind a gun by the end of season one. We're, do you kind of talk about these themes in the room to say, hey, these are kind of, these are questions we want to probe and make people think about? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly we kind of go back to basics at the beginning of every season and start to kind of remind ourselves the story we're telling and the things we're addressing. Those discussions, those really big thematic discussions take place largely before the first season when you're really kind of trying to figure out what the show is and what it's all about. Um, look, I think the duality, I think the reinvention of oneself in the model of kind of trying to achieve the American dream, like all of these people to some extent are ambitious for any number of reasons. Franklin's ambitions are out of a very different kind of initially on the surface level than Teddy's ambitions. Um, but ultimately, they're both people who kind of feel like they want more control over something, more power. Um, and I've always loved that Teddy and Franklin on the surface could not be more different, right? Like a kid in the hood who, who's just trying to kind of like get out of this cycle um, that he's been kind of stuck into. And then a kid from the Midwest who essentially had like every opportunity and every advantage, and yet they kind of come together um, and are weirdly similar. And I've always loved that. I think part of my favorite scenes to write for the show are the Teddy Franklin sit downs with those two going at each other from these very two different perspectives. And then what I think they're ultimately learning, uh, which neither of them would probably ever admit, is that they're kind of more alike um, than they would recognize. And one of my favorite moments was the ninth episode in this season where they have that moment where Franklin is completely lost and completely alone. Um, and Teddy is the only one who understands, who like truly understands the pressure that he's under and what he's trying to do. Um, and that felt like a really coming across that moment, even in the writing of it, was like, oh shit, this is such a cool thing, such a cool duality for these two very different people to be kind of coexisting within. Um, and it's exciting to see where they go from there. Yeah, I know there was, uh I'm trying to remember. I binged it, so all these episodes went yeah. in my head. But I think toward the toward the end of season two is the first time we see when Teddy and Franklin are in a room, and Teddy talks about how it's important to cede responsibility and a little bit of your power in order to grow to the size that you want to grow. And I think it was the first time we saw he was talking to Franklin and to himself at the same time. Yeah, I think the mo is that maybe the moment when they're in the bank? Yes. And they're in the yes. studio and Franklin goes to the window? Yes. Yeah, we were, again, that was kind of the beginning of, they get over this initial, like, thing where Teddy, in this really kind of awful way, recruits Franklin. But he recruits him in a way where he makes him understand that he has complete power over him. But that was the first moment of helping the kid 
or at least on the surface, it seemed like he was helping him, right? Franklin didn't know what to do with all this dirty cash, and Teddy knows this banker, of course. Now, there's also an element of Teddy wanting to control him, where now Teddy knows where Franklin's keeping his money. Sure. Which is good for Teddy to know. Um, but yeah, he's trying to build the kid up and build his confidence up, and it's self-serving, but it's also real, and Franklin's grappling with all those things. Because he doesn't know how big this is going to get, and he doesn't know what kind of boss he's going to be, or how much power how much power you actually do want to attain because everybody kind of thinks they want power and then you start to like move up those ranks and you realize that like there's awful things that come with that and responsibilities that come with that and stress that comes with that and you kind of have to decide like okay how much of that do I want on my plate how much is it really worth it as someone with no power I can say it's pretty cool down <laughs> here um, I'm hanging uh, it's funny, I, so I was talking to a couple of friends of, about the show, and uh, one person asked me for kind of what the best comparison point is. The trouble with the show is there kind of isn't one. Uh, That's great to hear, actually. Yeah, well, it was hard for me. Yeah. Glad it works for you. Well, uh, the, you want to do something that's different, though, you know? And it is. Yeah. It is. The closest thing that, that I, I said was it's, it's a little bit like Breaking Bad with more history behind it. Um, a, a much grittier, and the one thing when I was trying to explain it is, uh, when you're watching Breaking Bad, it seems like Walter White had no other options. Franklin seems to have other options, but is choosing this. Was that in, was that a big conversation in the writers' room about how you wanted to get Franklin into this lifestyle? Yeah, and you know, again, that's something I can throw back to Eric and John, where that was the thing that I that they had kind of come up with that I didn't change. And part of that was because it came from John's real experience where he had at times, he had been sent to a white school in the Valley at some point in his youth. Oh, wow. um, so it was very personal to him, um, that idea of somebody who had gone out and been a part of another world and kind of seen that. But I thought it was a really smart choice because the obvious thing would be, you could have made him a kid who had a horrible life, right? Who had a mother who, like we did, obviously his father was absent, but had a mother who was who didn't care or wasn't well or something, and they were in debt and they were going to lose their house. I mean, you could have piled, I think, all these obvious reasons on, um, but I think it was really smart to make him a kid who he could have chosen to go out into that world and like play the game and try to like win by the rules of the society that this country is kind of you know the rules we have dictated. Um, but he kind of understood what that was going to do to him, and he didn't have interest in playing by those rules, and he felt like he was going to get fucked around and beat down, and, um, and he, he would have every day. Um, and we kind of went at that very directly in the finale of this season, of the third season, which I was really proud of the episode and the way it kind of came together. Um, but yeah, it was absolutely a conscious choice, and I think it just made the whole thing more interesting and kind of a harsher look at the world we live in now, but certainly the world as it was in 1983 when we first meet him. And I'm so glad you brought up the finale of season three because that's my next question. Uh, it's, it's tough. I think when you watch the first episode of the first season and we see Franklin make the choice to come in here, it seems like it was a choice. It seems the finale of season three seems to dispel that idea to essentially say that even if Franklin had made other choices, yeah completely opposite choices, yeah. he would have ended up in the same place. Um, and what it feels like a little bit to me, and I would love to hear your thoughts on this, it kind of seems a little bit like it's saying, if you're growing up as an African American in a less affluent community, like Franklin does, there are going to be a litany of obstacles that you're going to have to overcome that people who are not in that situation are not ever gonna have to face. And those obstacles are often too hard to overcome. Yeah. Is that kind of where, where you were going there, and is that a story you wanted to tell from the very beginning? Yeah, I don't, I mean, I think certainly from the way it was set up with him, that was part of the DNA of the show and what we mm -hmm. were saying about the choices you make, and if you really want to get out from under the thumb of the system, what you maybe have to do if you're Franklin and you're in that place. But yeah, I mean, that was, that was the thing, man. It was just like, you, you know, and we talked a little bit about that in the room, and it was the note, are you really damned if you do, damned if you don't? Um, and Walter Mosley, who's been with the show from the very beginning and who I've come to really rely on and love, was like, yes, like you were fucked either way. My opinion of being a black man in America is you are, you are screwed either way. Mm. <laughs> and I was like, well, yeah, then that's, then that's where we're gonna go at. Now, I don't think you could argue that had he gone the other way, it would have been worse. 
Um, it's I don't gonna. Know how. I mean, yeah, this is gonna not end well. Spoiler alert, um, probably for anybody. Um, but it would have been an uphill struggle. It would have been brutal, and it would have been getting his fucking face put in the mud every day. And that's a hard. I, yeah, it sucks. Yeah, I, I I don't know that he's in a better situation now. Um, yeah. But I think that that leads me, and I, and I know that we're we're coming up on time, so I want to leave time for uh, other folks' questions. That kind of leads me to a final thought, which is that the interesting thing about watching this show is that the moral compass is constantly moving. Um, we think it's with Franklin. You you see once he I don't want to say too much, but once he pulls the trigger, he's not really our moral center anymore. Um, Teddy, again, I mentioned earlier, seems like a moral center. He's pulling triggers, so he's kind of not. And uh, Lucia, who seems wonderful in the first season, already turns on her family, and in the second season is also the one behind the gun. So it's interesting, do, do you, when you come to the ideas of this show, are you intentionally shifting the moral compass of the show with every episode? You know, I think part of what you, when you sign up to do a crime show or you know a drug show or however you want to kind of classify it in this genre, I think for us it was, it was what are these people all willing to do? Right? That was one of the big thematic things, was how far are they willing to go? At what point do you stop? You know, is there ever a line do you, do you, where you say, like, okay, this line I'm not crossing. Like, this is the thing I'm not willing to do. Um, and how far will they, they go? And I think that's a big part of what the arc for these characters will be all about. Um, do they have moments where they're looking to, to fully walk away? And if so, are they able to? And what does that mean for them? Um, but it's certainly something we're very conscious of and spend a lot of time talking about. That's awesome. Um, does anyone have, we can open it up for questions. <laughs> My name's Alaji. Hi. Uh, <laughs> put this right here. Um, I'm just really curious about the writer's room. Like yeah. I've always been curious about that. Like you said there was like a group of people in the writer's room. I'm wondering about, and I'll try to, you just stick with whatever you want to answer to this, but do you write chronologically? Are there, that's my first question, I guess. Do you write chronologically, and how do you, how are people choosing when people are writing lines? Like, is it like you, someone, like a head writer comes in with a structure, and then we're like, oh, well, this still isn't climactic, like this isn't what we need. I'm just really curious on how that, like, that creative process is going. Are they in there for seven hours yelling at each other? Like, whatever you want to tell me. Yeah, hopefully they're not yelling at each other. No, but in a good way. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> writer's room is kind of my full happy place, honestly, and all the hats you end up wearing running a show. Um, you know, we start up and there's a group of anywhere between, I think, eight, the fewest amount we've had is eight, and then last year we, I think, had 13, which eight? was. 13? 13 was a lot. Thir what, 13 what is, is everybody a lot doing? Of, like 13 people. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Um, they're all sitting around. Hopefully you can get everyone on the same page. And so it is my job to kind of come in and every once in a while I'll come in and be like, does anyone have anything they want to? But I'll come in in the first couple days and just download whatever I've been thinking about season and big things and arcs and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so you start talking big picture and you try to maybe have some sense of the goalpost at the end. Mm -hmm. But I also think that you then, you kind of hamstring yourself. Um, it's much more fun to kind of set up the general thing, the backbone for the season. For instance, this third season, I knew Franklin's neighbor is this girl that he had once been in love with and dated, and her father's a cop. And we had built a couple seasons now to getting to where, like, I knew the season was going to be out Franklin and the cop and the girl, that we had this triangle. Yeah. So to come in and start with that, and so you start talking big picture. We obviously have a pretty big cast, so you have to talk about a lot of different characters. So you start kind of big, and then you start kind of narrowing down when you have some framework for the season. But like, okay, what's the first episode going to look like? Mm. And you have big whiteboards, and you just start putting beats up for stories. And then do some of those 13 people just start like, okay, you go write scene one. No, so I get to kind of decide who, <laughs> You're the boss. Okay. who does what. Um, <laughs> there's got to be some st structure in there. Um, cool. and, and generally, it'll go with people who have been with the show now for a few years who I know they can know the characters. Yeah, I know they can write the show. Because there's always a question with a new writer of, like, are they going to be able to get the tone and write these voices? 
So typically I'll write the first one, and that means writing an outline based on the board, and then tearing that up maybe, and blah, 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 setting up the network, and then writing a script. So I try to give people ownership of the episodes. Yeah. Sometimes people will split a script, especially if I have like a new baby writer. I'll sometimes pair them with an older writer just to try to like help them yes. along in the process. But somebody ultimately has to have ownership of it. And I always felt, as a writer and other staffs, that I wanted to be assigned with really having to own it and get under the skin of it. Because even if we get a version of the room, uh, a version of the story in the room broken that we're happy with, I'd love the writer to come back and be like, you know, I'm writing it and like this scene feels soft and like I don't know what they're thinking here to really start to kind of own it. Um, cool. And we go through the season like that. Awesome. Thank you. Of course. Uh, any other? Uh, oh, back over there. <laughs> I uh, just wondering what it was like um, working with John, and what it, the impact of that is now on the show, and like in terms of the creative direction, or like has the trajectory already been set? Do you know what you're going into for the next two seasons? Yeah, uh, that is going to change. Yeah, um, it's interesting. I mean, the process of working with him. I mean, look, it changed so much for me, and like his blessing for me to be the guy to come in and help him tell this story it was something that, again, has changed my life and the way that I see the world. And like, I'll always be so grateful. Um, I'll always kind of take away those moments of like him being so excited about m the power of a moment and like those little things. There's a moment in the second season when Franklin's buddies, this white boy Rob, who's like in his crew, and his dad steals his cocaine. And we had him go to get the cocaine back, and John was the one who was like, he's gotta say, tell Rob to slap his daddy. And he's like, man, <laughs> slap your daddy. And at the time, it was just like one line, but it became like this hugely iconic moment, and John was so good at that. Um, and then I like, think the direction going forward, he was very gracious about allowing us to do what we needed to do in the room. He was not there every day. He liked being on set a lot more. That was kind of where he was happier. And so I take a lot of solace that like by this season, outlines would come out, scripts would come out, and he would just be ecstatic about it. Like he was so happy with the direction of where we were taking it and kind of what we had done that it, I feel very confident in kind of moving forward um, that he'd be happy with the things that we were doing. And, and look, over four years together, we talked a lot about what the story was and kind of where it had to go. And while we didn't have specifics for how things were gonna end, um, again, knowing that I can't be in John's head, I, I feel like we'll do him proud. Like, I feel like everybody will step up and kind of remember the things that he was always really passionate about and, and really try to serve those things in his memory. What kind of viewership do you get? Hundreds of millions? I mean, how many? Uh, Hundreds worldwide? of millions. <laughs> worldwide? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny. The numbers, we don't get the numbers for international stuff, so I really don't know. Okay. I know that over the course of all their platforms between streaming and TV and whatever else, mm -hmm. somewhere between 3.5 and 5 million a week are a seeing week. the show, um, wow. which is pretty great for us. I think like wow. the night of viewing is somewhere around a million viewers, or maybe the live plus threes, which are like within three okay. days. And you know, we just now live in this world, strangely, where like the ratings of that moment aren't that important. Okay. It's kind of more about creating an ecosystem that has something for everyone. So like you have to subscribe to the app or do whatever. Right. They just put us on Hulu now that Disney owns us. Yeah, I haven't watched. It. I mean, obviously, like the billboards are awesome. Like you drive by, you're like, yeah, I want to see that show. Yeah. And uh, I just never. You sometimes in LA get busy and just don't get to things. But sure. Obviously, I'm gonna go home and watch this straight through <laughs> one through four. Um, yeah, the first I know the first two seasons are now up on Hulu, which is yeah. I think really helped actually. Is like, it on Amazon Prime too? I don't think it's on Prime. You have to pay for it. You have to pay for it on iTunes or Amazon Prime right now. My question is, overall, the show is a success. I mean, you guys are doing well, and yeah. it's well-received. I mean, it's got like a 9.5 rating, so. Yeah, I think that part of what we've, we've managed to get better every year. Cool. And you can see it. I mean, you watch the first season, and it's still a little scattered. It's a lot of storylines, but as it kind of continues to sharpen its focus, it's, it's kind of come up more and more. And um, yeah. I know, I think my proudest moment was somebody sent me a link of, of Snoop Dogg watching the finale yeah, this year. And he nice. was like, motherfucking Snowfall. Right. And right. I was like, I'm, fuck, I'm good. Right. If, of course. if it's in the popular culture in that way and Snoop <laughs> shouting us out, like, but we're good. Right. Yeah, FX is now just kind of like, what do you need to tell the story? Like, how many seasons do you want to do? How do you want to finish it? How do you tell it the right way? How many? <laughs> uh, I've, at this point, I think six. six I seasons? think we're at the halfway point. Yeah, we love these LA dramas and um, cool. Well, congratulations. And yeah, Justified, sick. That's Appreciate awesome. Appreciate that, man. Thank you.
Well, I think that's all the time we have. Um, that's really exciting. You heard it here first, six seasons, yeah. what we're all hoping for. <laughs> and a movie, who knows? Uh, thank you so much for your time, Dave. Thanks I really appreciate it. Really thank you for coming it. out. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.